As Mandy said, uh, the pool is closed. It was like there was a collective sigh of relief across social media the last couple of weeks as parents sent their kids back to school. <laughs> a little bit of routine uh, returns to us. And uh, you might have noticed Starbucks is once again um, cramming pumpkin-flavored stuff into every conceivable comestible. So it's fall. We're glad uh, you're all here. It's the start of a new uh, school year for many, and in the life of the church, it's the start of a new programming year. And it makes sense that we're going to start a new uh, teaching series on Sunday mornings here. For the next um, eight weeks or so, September and October, we're going to be looking at the New Testament letter to the Ephesians. Uh, you can start turning there if you like in uh, your Bibles. If you're using a, one of these red Bibles in the seat in front of you, it's on page 1067. But also feel free to turn it up on your phone or your own uh, well-worn Bible, whatever you like. Um, before we get there, though, I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing what we call a book study. Why are we going to spend eight weeks or so uh, on Sunday mornings talking about this 2,000-year-old letter? Actually, uh, the truth is that it's not just on Sunday mornings. Many of the groups that you just heard about this fall are going to be chewing on this uh, same chunk of, of the Bible as well. So if you'd like to dig a little bit deeper, uh, consider some of the short-term groups or long-term groups that are listed as studying Ephesians this fall, and, and it'll be this great kind of church-wide conversation. But why? why? Why study a book rather than just kind of jumping straight into something that's maybe a little bit more relevant, a little bit more immediately applicable to our lives today? I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. That's a great, a great question. And really, what it boils down to is authority. You'll find that here at Central, we often do these things that we call book studies uh, because of questions of authority. Uh, I want to give a couple reasons. Um, and here's the first one. If we were to just jump straight to uh, applications and talk about things that are immediately relevant, um, you guys would be pretty reliant upon me or whatever talking head with a microphone is up here to tell you what's important, how to live, what's relevant, how to apply it to your lives right now. And at the end of the day, uh, you should really only care moderately what I think. <laughs> you should care deeply what God thinks, what his word says about your lives. So when we study books of the Bible together, hopefully we as a community are gathering skills so that we all individually and collectively become a little bit better uh, studying God's word and applying it to our own lives. And in so doing, we become less and less dependent upon whatever talking head with a microphone uh, tells us is what God's word says. Does that make sense? It's about authority. Who's in charge? Uh, here's, here's another issue of authority. It's about who sets the agenda. So um, every, I don't know, nine months or so, the preachers and uh, worship arts department and some of you guys get together to brainstorm about the content diet, the Sunday morning teaching for the next 18 months or whatever. And we, we want to think about what's relevant, what are the felt needs in this community and the, and the unfelt needs, what are the, what are the culturally relevant topics, what's, the, what's our, our historical moment, what fits our context in Towson and Baltimore. Those are important questions. We try to stir all of those things into the mix. And for some of those reasons, we're looking at Ephesians for the next two months. But... At the end of the day, we want to consciously submit our agenda to God's agenda. And by studying Ephesians, it means that things that surface in the book of Ephesians, we sort of got to deal with. We got to at least try to address them. And so we're saying, God, you set the agenda rather than me or a little committee setting the agenda. Does that make sense? It's about authority. That's why uh, we're doing, doing it this way. I hope you enjoy it. Um, to me, that makes me a little bit expectant. Like maybe in the next couple of months, God is going to start a fresh conversation and teach us things in this church that we weren't even anticipating. I'm excited about it. Um, Ephesians. For, uh, it's a letter. It's a letter. Uh, in many ways, it's similar to other first century letters written by an individual to a group of people. Uh, for about 1,800 years or so, uh, it was taken for granted that it was written by um, a guy named Paul. He's mentioned in verse 1. Uh, the apostle, the missionary, the church planter, big dude in the early church. In the last 200 years or so, um, scholars have started to question that. And right now, scholarship is sort of divided on whether Paul wrote it or whether somebody else uh, sort of in Paul's tradition wrote it perhaps uh, shortly after Paul died. Uh, the truth is, in the first century, it was a fairly common practice for people to write 
under somebody else's name, sort of in their tradition, and it wasn't kind of the, the dodgy thing that it would be to do that today. Um, so it was a, it was a known practice. Uh, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter a whole lot whether Paul wrote this or somebody else wrote this. Our, our, um, the authority, our faith in the authority of this doesn't rest in Paul writing it. But during this series, we're going to refer to the author as Paul. Most likely, this was directed to a church or a group of churches in the ancient city of Ephesus, um, which is in modern-day Turkey, a little bit south of the city of, called Izmir. Um, and, and Ephesus was, um, it was called the mother city of, of ancient Asia. It was the uh, headquarters of the Roman proconsul of Asia. Uh, it was the third largest, wealthiest city in the um, Roman Empire behind Rome and Alexandria. It was very, very cosmopolitan, very diverse. People coming from all different ethnicities and backgrounds and, uh, and sort of religiously pluralistic. One of the things, though, that was uh, pretty distinct about Ephesus was that it was the hometown, the, the worship center of the Greco-Roman goddess Diana. Some of you will know. She goes also by the name Artemis. And there was a temple there to Diana that uh, was actually four times larger, historians tell us, than, than the Parthenon in Greece. So this amazing, huge temple. And twice a week, people who worshipped Diana would like, process with her statues through the town. And, and put those statues back in the temple, which was this huge sort of treasury bank vault uh, of, of treasure uh, in honor of, of Diana. She was seen uh, as the um, sort of one of the head goddesses. She was a protector for anybody who followed her. Um, she was called queen of the gods. She was seen as a, to be a daughter of Zeus. Sometimes she was called savior. Sometimes she was called lord. And it's into this environment that's very diverse, very religiously pluralistic, that this letter is written. And one of the main themes of this letter is just unity. People coming from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different vocations, and the message is, in Christ you are one. Uh, it's one of the best distillations of the Christian faith. It's like Christianity reduction sauce. <laughs> Uh, and it sort of focuses for six chapters on what God has done in the past through Jesus and is doing in the present through his spirit to, to rescue his people and to, to mold them into a, to a new society right there in the middle of the old one. Uh, it's an incredible letter, and we will get into it now. Uh, I'll read the first 14 verses, and then I'll pray, and then we'll jump in. You can follow along with me if you like. Here we go, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, some of your translations there will say saints instead of holy people, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is fairly standard first century letter opening um, with, with sort of a Christian understanding. Like, do people say peace anymore, like, other than surfers and skaters? Like, hey, peace, bro. Well, anyway, it's, it's like when Christians say peace in a greeting, maybe in a, you've been in a church service where people say the peace be with you. We're using a word that everybody uses, but we mean it in a kind of a deeper Jesus-centered way. And that's exactly what's going on with this greeting here. Typical greeting, very Jesus-centered. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves." In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times had reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we also were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. 
When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Father, by your spirit, who I believe inspired these words, would you come, would you help us to understand them in their original context? Would you help us to apply them to our lives today in a way that changes us to be more like your son? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Did you guys get lost there (laughs) in those 14 verses? If you did, uh, it's all right. It's kind of breakneck pace. Uh, What I want to do is very quickly summarize those 14 verses to kind of uh, help us follow the train of thought, and then we'll go back and we'll drill down on one label. Um, It seems so convoluted and so breakneck because really verses 3 through 14 in the original are all one sentence. So here's the first application. If you're terrible at punctuation, there's hope for you. Maybe 2,000 years from now, somebody will still be reading your tweets. Just kidding, that's not the application. It's, it's like, though, like Paul is so in love with, with God and what God has done. He's so ecstatic about it that he just kind of has this verbal diarrhea, for lack of a better word. It's just, it's like a motor mouth about how excited he is about what God has done. Look at verse 3. This is how the whole thing kicks off. Praise be to the God and Father. Okay, that's, what, that, that's the opening line that sets the tone for everything that follows. So everything that follows in verses 3 through 14 is, is part of this, this praise. It's part of this prayer. It's part of a, a song. All right, that's the tone for it. You, when we read it, it probably sounded like a terribly convoluted theology textbook. But it's not. It's like this prayer about how great God is. I think that's worth recognizing. The way we pray says a lot about what we believe and who we think God is. All right. Uh, take a look with me on the screen. We're just going to kind of distill what I think is the, the argument here, the, the, the outline uh, in verses 3 through 14 very briefly. Verse 3 says, praise God, bless God for the way he has blessed us. God is great because he has blessed us. And then everything after this is kind of the how he has blessed us. Okay? Look at verses 4 through 6. Praise him because he has chosen us and predestined us by his will. That's essentially what verses 4 through 6 are saying. Sometimes we get all wrapped around the axle by this word uh, predestination. We talked about this a few weeks ago in our Joseph series. Um, I want to explain what I think is the tone of this, this word chosen and predestined here. I've got these friends uh, who live in Michigan, a couple who are incredible parents, but for whatever reason, they haven't been able to have biological kids. And they have a beautiful little adopted girl and they're in the process of adopting another, uh, of another wonderful little girl from China. And she's still in China, still in the orphanage, and yet she's their daughter. It's like as good as done. They've submitted the paperwork. It's going through the system. They've done the home study. Uh, her name is being changed to their name. All of that is in process, but this girl doesn't know her parents. She's young, she hasn't met them yet, I don't think. She certainly doesn't, hasn't wrapped her mind around what it means to be a daughter of these parents, but they love her. She's their daughter, though she lives far away and doesn't really know it yet. And because they love her, they are rescuing her from this orphanage into a family. And it's not like she did a test and they looked at all the scores and were like, we want that one. No. They, they loved her. Their, their love was a choosing love that says, for whatever reason, we want you and we're going to do what we, we're going to rescue you and you're going to become part of our family. That, I think, is the tone of the way this chosen and predestining language is being used here. I, I use that metaphor to explain the tone, not to explain sort of the, the theology. We're not going to get into the the deep theology of that this morning um, because we don't have the time. Verses um, 7 through 9. We're still talking about reasons we're praising God. 7 through 10. We're praising God because he's forgiven us. 
This is the mechanism by which he's adopted us. He's forgiven us by Jesus' blood. He's redeemed us, and he's poured out his grace on us. And he's revealed his will to us. He's not left us in the dark, but he's communicated to us that his plan throughout all of history was to rescue us by Jesus and to take people who have broken relationships with other people and people who have broken relationships with themselves and people who have broken relationships with God and to heal those relationships and to unite those people under Christ in a new family, a new society. That's what verses 7 through 10 are about. Uh, verses 11 and 12 then are very similar to verses 4, and six, 4 through 6. It just goes back to saying, because, we're praising God because he's chosen us and he's predestined us according to his will for his, the praise of his glory. And then verses 13 and 14 take what Paul has been saying about himself and about the apostles and applies it to his audience. Whoever's reading this letter and is like, look. I'm not just talking about us here. I'm talking about you too. You guys too, if you've believed in Jesus, this all is true for you. You've been adopted. You've been chosen. You've been loved. Jesus has died for you. And the down payment on that, the sign of that is that you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's what verses, verses uh, 13 and 14 are saying. Okay? I hope that helps clarify the kind of convoluted enormous sentence there. I want to drill down for the rest of our time on one label that I think um, helps us to understand this passage. And that label crops up in verse 2. It's saints or holy ones. I'm, we're calling it label um, on purpose. Labels are nouns or adjectives that we slap on something to kind of identify it, right? Right? And the truth is that when we slap nouns or adjectives on people, often it can be pretty damaging. There's a, a Canadian theologian, John Stackhouse, who likes to say we label people so that we can limit them. We put a box around them and say, he or she is in this box, whatever label we're going to stick on there. That way I don't have to get to know them further. I don't have to treat them as a full human being. They're just in this box. I can walk on past that box. We label them so we can limit them, and we limit them because eventually our goal is to liquidate them. To treat them as subhuman, to climb over them or walk past them or ignore them or not get to know them. Often, the tragedy of the way we work is that we label people with the goal of eventually liquidating them. And I want you to hear that this passage is using labels in a very different way, and we're going to focus on one label, verse 2, the word saints or holy ones. Just because of the way language has evolved for hundreds of years, I think that's a terribly unhelpful word. At least for me, it conjures wacky images. I, I hear the word saints or holy ones, and I think of like a marble statue on a, on a pedestal somewhere on a sidewalk of some like saint from history, sort of totally otherworldly and kind of imperiously looking down with a smug, saintly grin or whatever. Or I think of, I think of in, a, in a, an old church, I think of this kind of stained glass saint looking down from above uh, with light streaming through. And these things might be beautiful, but they're, they're not human, Right? They're, they're like unobtainable for starts. They're up above humans. The, the statue on a pedestal is not down there on the sidewalk where the rest of us live. The stained glass figure is up there looking smugly down on the pews where the rest of us sit on pews or chairs and all of our sort of broken real humanity. And I think it's an unhelpful image, at least what it conjures in my mind. The Red Bibles uh, translate the word saints as holy people, holy ones. It's the same word uh, in Greek. But holy, in my mind, has, has the same connotation. Some of you will know that one of the connotations of the word holy in the Bible means set apart, distinct. And that's a little bit more helpful. Um, it means it's, gotta, it's, it's over here rather than with everything else. But that, to me, is also unhelpful because I, my mind goes to the crusaders in the Holy Land, and I think of their walled fortresses up on the top of hills and mountaintops in the Holy Land because they were set apart, they were the holy ones, and they lived up there behind rock walls instead of being down in the villages where normal people lived. And that's not what the Bible means when the Bible talks about saints or holy ones. 
Every time the Bible uses this word saint or holy ones, when it's not referring to God, it's talking about someone or something that has been made or remade for a special purpose. Purpose made. I think that's a, that's a much better modern way of understanding what Paul is getting at here. Take that new gloss, purpose made, and slap it in there in verse 2. To the purpose made people in Ephesus who are faithful. Slap it in verse 4 where it says we're made to be holy. Does it make sense? He chose us in him before the creation of the world to to be purpose made and blameless in his sight. In love, he chose us and arranged for us to be adopted to sonship through Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will. Look how much, how often this idea of purpose crops up in accordance with his will. It crops up again then in verse 9, which he purposed in Christ. It crops up again uh, later on then in verse 11. Purpose, purpose, purpose. Your purpose made, remade for a purpose. Begs the question, what's the purpose, right? If God has gone to these incredible lengths by the death of Jesus to remake people for a purpose, what's the purpose? And I think he tells us that in verses 6, in verse 12, and verse 14, look at those verses. What's the phrase that keeps cropping up there? What's the purpose? Look at verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace. Verse 12. That in order that we might be for the praise of his glory. Same wording except it crops out grace. End of verse 14. To the praise of his glory. This is, this is the purpose. This is what we're purpose made for. It's to be for the praise of his glory, which I think just means we are made and remade to live and to talk and to behave in such a way that people worship God. That's what you're made for. I remember when this first really clicked in me. I was uh, going to college out of the country, and you know... Um, on airplanes when you have to fill out those like immigration landing cards and it asks you for your name and for your occupation. After the first half a dozen times or so, I was tired of putting student. I was like, who cares? Who even reads these things? I'm going to put hijacker, see what happens. I did. <laughs> One time, <laughs> you guys are looking at my beard and you're like, that's a long con. <laughs> uh, one time, I was, I was like, you know what? I'm not a student. Student's not my occupation. It's just a phase of life I'm in. My occupation is missionary. What I do for 30 or 40 or 50 hours a week with this student organization on campus is all framed by two words, mission and maturity. Anybody who doesn't know Jesus, we consider it our mission. My friends and I who know Jesus to introduce them to Jesus. And anybody who does know Jesus, we consider it our job to help those people grow to maturity in Jesus. That's what I was all about. That's what I existed for. I, I knew that my purpose was to be a missionary. Man, I live with focus and with joy. I think now, a little bit further down the road, with a little bit more maturity, I realize that my definition of God's purpose for me could have been broader. It could have actually included student, rather than student just being a cover for me. God's purpose for me during college was to be a missionary, but also to be a student in such a way that I lived for the praise of his glorious grace, to be a student in such a way that other people worshiped God. What does that look like? Because you guys are bankers and baristas and doctors and dentists and uh, attorneys and artists and whatever else. Full-time dads, full-time moms. Got a range of different occupations and careers. What does it look like in your sphere to live for the praise of his glorious grace? And I think this letter is helpful because he's writing to a very diverse audience where you've got slaves and sailors and you've got artists and attorneys and all of these different people in one location. And Paul is saying what makes you guys one is you have one Savior and you are all, regardless of the background and ethnicity and career you're coming from, you all have one label, your purpose made. 
We live so that people worship God. What does that look like? I want to give you some quick bullet points. I think it looks like excellence. In the pastoral letters, uh, Paul uses this phrase, live in such a way that your lifestyle adorns the gospel. In your, your chosen path right now, are you living as excellently as you can? And you're like, I was going to do that anyway. I make more money. <laughs> no, the point of, of being as excellent as you can in your, your chosen profession, in your career path, is because it can adorn the gospel. Think about it the other way. If you are terrible, people are not going to look at your lifestyle and be like, I want to be like that guy. But if you are doing an amazing job as a full-time dad, other people are going to look at you and be like, what is different about this guy? And then, it's like a necklace that grabs your attention. Once they've seen that and they're paying attention, they see that your life is actually framed around Jesus. Your lifestyle causes people to worship God. Are you being excellent? Are you being as good as you can? I could have done a better job as a student. I could have taken my job as a student more seriously. Here's the next one, integrity. In your chosen profession, are you living with integrity? By this I mean, are the values that shape your character the ones that you're co-opting from your workplace, which might be backbiting and it might be climbing on other people's backs and it might be do whatever it takes to get ahead, or are the values that are shaping you derived from God's word? Are the values that are shaping you based on Jesus' character? Are you living with integrity? regardless of the culture of your workplace. Here's the next one, evangelism. And this is hard for us. One of the things that separates human beings from other incredible creatures is our capacity for language. This is one of the reasons that I think this, is, this points to the fact that we have been set apart for the praise of his glorious grace. We've got to use our mouths. Are you sharing about the Jesus you love, the Jesus you live for, during your week, in your life. That's hard for a lot of us. It's hard for me. Are we doing it? Are we using our mouths? Because they're purpose made. Here's the next one. Integration. Not integrity this time. Integration. We got some wicked smart people here. Are you thinking as hard about your faith, about Jesus, as you do about your profession? Are you putting as much energy and focus into being a disciple of Jesus as you do into your respective field? This is a place where C.S. Lewis is a great model for us. He was an English professor. His field was literature. And yet he turned all of that incredible intellect and training and skill set onto his life as a disciple. Onto writing theology and writing literature that exalted Jesus and that pointed through literary means, towards Jesus? Are you integrating your life as a Christian, your life as a professional, whatever? Here's the last one, love. <laughs> this is what will point people to Jesus. If you live with love the way he did, are you living sacrificially? Are you living marked by forgiveness? Are you living a life of love? These are the ways in our various spheres, and you could add on other bullet points, that we live so that people worship God. That's the label, that's one of many labels that this passage puts on us. Purpose made. Purpose made. Whatever your vocation, whatever your background, we're united around this purpose that we all have to live so that God is adored and worshipped. Here's the question I want to end with, though. Why? Why is that good news? I think it's good news because, as I said a few minutes ago, often we use labels a different way. We use labels to limit us and to liquidate us and each other. And many of us live our lives under the shackles of labels that have been applied to us in the past. You can fill in the blank. Maybe somebody called you a fa failure. Maybe somebody made you feel unloved. Maybe somebody said you're not going to succeed. Maybe somebody said you are unlovable. Maybe somebody said you're not good enough. Maybe somebody said you are pretty, and that has defined you and limited you.
Maybe the label you've slapped on yourself is successful, and that has become a slave master for you. What this passage is saying, those labels are not the ones that shape who you are. Instead, listen to what God says about you. Look at what God has done for you. Praise him for what he's done for you. This is what he's done. Jesus has loved you so much that he's died for you. Since before the earth was made, God chose you and said, I'm going to pour out my grace on this person. And he's given you a purpose. Your unique skill set, your unique passions, your unique place in history, in your family, with your relationships. He's made you for a purpose to live so that people worship him. That is the label that is meant to be defining us, is it? Is it? Are we living as saints? Are we living as those who are purpose made? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this uh, letter to the Ephesians. I'm excited about the next uh, several weeks we have to chew on this together. I pray for conversations over the next uh, few weeks offline, not only on Sunday mornings, but with family and colleagues and kids and group members, that we would hear you speaking through your word to shape us to be like your son for the point that you are adored in all the world. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.